How's it going, folks? And on the line here, we have a special guest. We have Simon Grimm, formerly known as Simon Gotch in the WWE. And he is on the line with us for Talking Heel here on Heel by Nature. And we just want to thank you for taking time out of your busy day, Simon, for being with us here. Uh, admittedly, my day is not that busy. It's in the middle of the week. So, you know, I just uh, hit the gym, you know, did the... Uh was actually talking with my uh, my gear maker earlier, uh, which is why you people don't know this because you're listening to a recording, obviously. But uh, this was we were actually supposed to record this about an hour and a half ago, but I had to keep pushing it back because uh, my gear maker was here and I was I was working with him on a, a new set of gear. So uh, now we're we are where we're at. We so, are yeah. where we're at, and basically, I don't want to get too far into the history. A lot of people do know your history. I want to get into some of the meat and potatoes of your career most definitely with NXT and the WWE you did start back on the indie scene in the early 2000s you worked many different groups APW PWG Chikara but let's speak on your time in NXT and in the WWE you got your start in NXT back in 2013 eventually moved to the main roster in 2016 First question here, what was the backstage climate like at NXT compared to the main roster? Did you feel it was harder to maybe make close friends in NXT as you were all competing for a spot on the main roster? Uh, actually, no, I did not feel that. Um, one, one of the, the philosophies I, I sort of have been very big, very much a believer in with wrestling is that the whole pretense of someone's going to take your job or take your spot is complete and utter bullshit. The reality of it is, is that we all do something different. We all bring something different to the table. So, realistically speaking, uh, I actually said this one day it was to Jason Jordan because if you ever went to the PC, you saw there there used to be these signs up all over these banners, and one of them said, "You're here to take a spot, not fill a spot." And I looked at Jay and I went, "That sign's bullshit." He said, "What do you mean?" I went, "Well, I can't do what you can do. I mean, I am not a a jacked biracial Adonis who can jump to the moon and is an amateur wrestling champion." He's like, you're not a, a lifelong independent wrestler who's uh, been all around the country and, and worked with a ton of different people. Like, we don't do the same thing. I can't take your job. You can't take my job. We do two different jobs. A carpenter can't take a job away from a tile layer. You know, it's like they don't do the same job. So I think what it really comes down to is even if there are only so many, quote, unquote, jobs available in wrestling, you're not really competing for the same job because you don't do the same job. If they want – Jason Jordan and they don't want me, it doesn't matter how good I do my job. They, they, they're like, we don't want, this is not the position, we're, this is not the job we're looking for. We're not looking for someone who can do this for us, we're looking for someone who can do this. Then that's beyond whether, you know, like competing in that nature is just really pointless. It's just, it's something that guys do to themselves and it just brings a bunch, a bunch of stress and negativity that you don't really need. Did you notice a lot of the guys say at the Performance Center at NXT during your time there that they would be in that mentality where they're always thinking that they're competing with everyone else and almost like working themselves up? Uh, some guys did, but nothing I could really like ever put a finger on. Um, I think a lot of it really comes down to just how confident you are in your ability. If you believe in yourself and in what you're doing, uh, you're, you're never going to suffer that sort of feeling. I think that's more someone who's insecure who's worried about this, about uh, whether or not they're going to be able to do anything or if they have anything to offer. Uh, I remember hearing, of all people, uh, when I was an extra, this is going back like 2009, Shad from uh, Crime Time mm -hmm. talking, uh, made, was telling a story about when he did his, uh, his tryout. He was wearing a hoodie because, you know, it was cold. Mm -hmm. So he was wearing a hoodie. And some guy who was an indie wrestler was like, bro, you got to take that off. That's my gimmick. <laughs> and he goes, your gimmick is a hoodie? And he was just sort of completely, because he he didn't have wrestling background, so he was just sort of he's like it was completely insane to him that this guy was complaining that he was also wearing a hoodie. But there, that's how like someone who's grossly insecure acts is that they're you know oh you're taking my thing, like, dude. If your thing's any good, it doesn't matter if I, I you and I can stand next to each other doing the exact same thing. If you're better than me, people will notice. If you're not, then that's on you, not me. Speaking it's not my problem. If, you know. Sorry. Um, oh, yeah, no, I was saying, speaking of gimmicks, uh, I know in the past somebody like Tyler Bate went on to say that someone like you took his gimmick. Like, what was that all about? Tyler was like 17 when he wrote that, um, which is it, the, the story behind that was at the time he had started doing a gimmick. It wasn't even I think he'd been wrestling for about a year at that point. 
And he started doing a gimmick. Uh, it wasn't even under the Tyler Bate name. It was under a different name for a very specific promotion in England. I don't remember which one it was. But in, like, December, like, he literally started doing this, I think, in December of that year. And that was when he called me out, quote, unquote, on stealing his gimmick. And all I could think was, well, I've been doing this for a couple of years. I've been, like, I have been wrestling for 12 years at that point. I've been doing a gimmick for a couple of years. And on top of that, I've been in WWE for six months at that point. And they signed me for the gimmick, which they'd seen me do the first time a year earlier. Mm-hmm. So I was like, it wasn't even something I felt I really needed to respond to. And when I first met him, there was like, I first met him in England actually when we were uh, over there for uh, WWE. It was the first UK thing we did right after we got called up. And him and uh, Trent Seven were there with uh, Marty Jones. And Trent was, you know, big hug, really polite. And I could see Tyler look kind of nervous. And I was like, oh, here, come here, man. Come on, give me a hug. You know, I gave him a hug and everything and just chatted friendly. And, He's a nice guy. Like I said, he was a young kid who said something stupid. I'm not going to hold it against him. At the end of the day, if I it, I didn't take it personally because, like I said, it's, he's someone young who's trying to get himself over. He doesn't necessarily understand that that you know that's not the best way to do it. And eventually, he realized just be good. You know, you just got to be good at what you do, and people will notice. And they have. That's good for him. And I know you've told this story probably a bunch of times now, but. Our fans, I did put it out there to some of our subscribers on YouTube. And we do have a large following on YouTube. We have over 25,000 subscribers. And I put it out there. What do you want to know about Simon Graham? And it keeps on coming up. The incident between you and Sin Cara. I know you've probably told it a million times. Is there anything you can say about that incident that maybe you haven't said before? Or even give us just a brief rundown of what happened. Oh, I can give you a brief rundown. I mean, like I said, I've been very open about it. Uh, I find it interesting that every time I do one of these uh, podcasts, they always repost the same sort of information that I've said as though it's the first time I've ever said it, which I – and I don't even mean the podcast guys. I mean the uh, the various websites and uh, dirt sheets. They always – Simon Gosh reveals inside details about his fight with uh, Sankara. And I'm like, well, first of all, it wasn't a fight, and secondly, I mean – I revealed those six months ago when I did my first interviews and I've, every time I've been asked a question I've been very open about what so happened. Do you have any additional details that the, the dirt sheets can uh, post up tomorrow? Uh, no, but I can tell you the exact same story and they will post it like it's something new. So okay, that's... well let's, let's go with the same story but maybe, <laughs> let's, let's go maybe word it a little differently. So, um, uh, Sankara, Jorge and I, we, would, we just used to go back and forth with little digs and insults at each other for fun and it was almost like who could get the other one to crack first. The, the idea being, as soon as you got the other guy mad, it was like, that's when you won. It was like, if he was like, oh, fuck you, motherfucker. That was when it's like, okay, I got you. Good. That's when it was, that was when we knew we got each other. So we were at the, it was the, uh, the draft. It was the day of the draft. I think the building is in Rhode Island. Um, it's in Rhode Island or Virginia, somewhere like that, or Connecticut. I think it's Rhode It was, I know I flew into Logan, or I flew out of Logan, uh, International Airport, which is Boston. So I think it was Rhode Island. Uh, so we're at catering the table. It's, uh, me, uh, and Sakara sitting right across from each other at the table. And then to my right is, uh, Sesu, uh, Uha Nation, Apollo Cruz, whatever you want to call them. So how many and people then, are at this table here? Like how big are, how big are these tables? A uh, decent size, maybe, uh, four feet across three feet, you know, three and a half, four feet across. Like they're pretty big tables. And how many people uh, are for, in catering at this time? Uh, maybe a dozen, two dozen, like maybe uh, probably about two dozen, three dozen. Actually, now I'm thinking about it. It was decent sized catering place, you know, and it was early in the day, so people were getting lunch. It was around noon. Um, we had to be there early, I think, because they're doing the draft thing. Mm-hmm. Whereas normally, I think our call time would have been one. We actually had to be there earlier. We had to be there at noon or eleven that day. Um, so me, Manny, uh, Callisto, and and Uha were tra- were traveling together. So we got there. We're having lunch, and then it's like I said, it's me, Uha, Manny, and then Jorge. We're sitting at the table, we're going back and forth, whatever, and I I dig him with a pretty hard shot. <laughs> and it was one of those ones where, at the time, it didn't seem out of the ordinary for the sort of stuff we said to each other. But apparently, I found out later, at least the rumor was, that the, some stuff had actually happened to him in his personal life that I wasn't aware of. So this hit kind of a, a nerve that I didn't know it would hit. So... I say it, I look back down at my plate, go back to eating, and all of a sudden I stand up and yell, what the fuck? Because my face just started hurting and the world kind of went black. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't, I, I couldn't see anything. And my vision's slowly starting to come back, and I, I remember the order of things were, why does my face hurt? Is my shirt wet? Why do I smell Diet Coke? And then my vision cleared up, and I saw Jorge rounding the table, running. And I went, all I could think was, why is Jorge running at me? 
and he tried to double leg me. He tried to shoot in and take me down. And my first reaction was just sort of throw my hip into him, grab him around the chin, grab him by the tricep and pull him in and almost a shoot headlock. And I'm just sitting there going, dude, what the fuck? What the fuck? Because I don't know what's going on. To this, like, at that point, I have a probable concussion. My vision's blurry. Uh, I'm soaked in Diet Coke. And I'm just trying to figure out what's happening. Eventually, we get pulled apart. Uh, and Jorge's just cursing a blue streak. Fuck you, motherfucker. Fuck you. So who, like, was, so what who pulled you guys apart? Do you, do you recollect? Uh, it was a group of people. We were struggling for probably like 10, 15 seconds. Like it was one of those things where it, it was long enough to where it took, cause it took people a second to figure out what was going on. So we're like, he's trying to, t- to tackle me. And I'm just like, no, we're not moving here. I, there's a moment where I genuinely thought I should throw him. And I, I, cause I remember that thought it just sort of creeped into my head as I was, my, my brain was clearing a little bit. It was throw the motherfucker. And then I just got that other voice. Don't do it. You're going to get fired. <laughs> and it's like, Okay, I'm calm. All right, good. Figure out what's going on. Just don't escalate the violence. That was my only thought. So we get pulled apart, and the only way I remember specifically, because we're still sort of facing off, people are pulling us apart. I'm not fighting. I'm just standing there trying to figure out what's going on. But Jorge's actively still trying to come at me. He's being held back. And finally, uh, Bray Wyatt comes in, waist locks me, picks me straight up in the air, turns, sets me down. <laughs> so I'm out of the middle of the pile. Um uh, one of the caterers came up, gave me a rag with some ice in it, because uh, at that point, my eye had started to bleed, okay. uh, just my eyebrow. And uh, we talked about it with uh, – I had to talk about it with Mark Carano and Legal because there was some concern. Obviously, hitting me in the head was a uh, – technically is – I think that qualifies as attempted murder, if I recall correctly. Anytime you strike someone in the head with a for- with a weapon, de- mm-hmm. something deemed a weapon, it's – I, remember, I, I worked as a security guard real briefly out of high school, and I remember we were told very specifically, like, if we used our baton on anyone, we were not to ever hit them in the head or the chest because that's considered attempted murder because it can be a kill shot, whereas a hit to the arm or the leg is non-lethal. So they were obviously concerned legally about what could happen, and then they were also concerned if I'd said something racially motivated because of that stuff that had happened with uh, uh, Del, Del Rio, Rio. Yeah. With, yeah, with Del Rio and the writer previously, which is funny because there was a side story where someone had theorized that I had said something racial to Jorge, which I did not, for just that reason. And it pissed me off to hear that one from fans because all I could think was, okay, you're jumping to this conclusion based on something that happened between two completely different guys. Mm-hmm. Well, at the time, and, though, like nobody really knew what was said. All that was known, save from like the dirt sheets, was okay. Um, you said something to him that basically triggered something, and then they, you know, the first thing that came to mind in a lot of these fans' eyes was it must have been racially motivated. No, the weird part about that is I randomly I'm I'm not Hispanic, but uh, due to my aesthetic, I've more than once been confused for and accused in several cases. If you ever if you ever want to see something really deplorable, go on YouTube and look at the comments in any uh, any of the videos that are like clips of my interviews, and you'll see some extremely uh, running the gamut from anti-Semitic, I am Jewish, mm-hmm. to uh, anti-Hispanic uh, rhetoric. The strangest one being the uh, the two guys that are going back and forth where someone calls me a just like every other lazy Mexican and he's going off on this whole thing and someone goes, dude, he's not Hispanic. He clearly said he's Jewish in the video. And then someone defends the guy s- saying the racist stuff oh, saying, oh, man. what, you think, you think Jews can't be Latino? Man. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a more reasonable joke than, hey, you're being racist. Stop it. Wow. <laughs> so that, that was an odd one. Uh but so that all happens, and then after the fact, I found out Jorge actually threw the can underhand, which was really impressive. I have a photo of it where you can see the ring from where it hit me. Like, he hit me with perfectly the bottom of the, of the soda can. So you can see the ring around my eye. It's a perfect wow. circle, uh, which also one of the stories was that he knocked me out with one punch. And beyond the fact that I didn't get knocked out, because I concussion, yes. Knocked out, no. They're not the same thing. <laughs> um, and you left but, the building after that, correct? Yeah, the fun part of that was because I, I traveled with uh, with uh, Cruz and Callisto. They had to stay for the show. I don't have a car. I also have one eye swelling shut. So for some reason, rather than booking me out of Rhode Island, they booked me out of Logan still, which was, like I said, an hour drive away. And I, I asked the office, I was like, hey, could, I, could, someone, could you get Bruno or something like that? Just give me a lift to the airport. And they're like, no, Bruno's got to stay. So Bruno takes me to a rental car place. Oh, wow. I've got to rent a car on my own dime. 
it's a the only thing they have is a Ford F one fifty. Oh wow! I'm driving through Boston traffic uh, on a uh, it was a Mon- was it a Monday or Tuesday? I can't remember. It was a Monday. I think it was a Tuesday. It, it was, was a Tuesday. It was, yeah, because it was a SmackDown, right? Yeah, because I was supposed to because I was flying home. I would have flown home the next day anyway. So yeah, it would have been a Tuesday. So this is even so, before the show driving, started. So this would be in the afternoon at some point. Yeah, so it's like I'm driving through Boston traffic, which is terrible, with one eye in a Ford F-150 <laughs> and a possible concussion. <laughs> I, I get to the airport. I, uh, I go get lunch at Wahlburger because I was like, you know, it's been a bad day. Let, let, let me amuse myself by eating at Donnie Wahlberg's restaurant. <laughs> and, uh, but I have sunglasses on the whole time I'm in the airport because I'm trying not to bother any of the other passengers with my bloody, you know, red eye. And did and anybody just, recognize you at this point? No, no, and I, I had a, I think they had to do seven stitches. It was like f- four above and three below uh, in like the, on my eye where the can hit me. So I'm in the airport the whole time. I've got a th- I'm starting to get a headache. I've got my uh, sunglasses on, and they do the thing. It's on JetBlue where they call for uh, if anyone needs any extra time getting down the runway or anything, the jetway or anything, please come up now. So I walk up. I don't even break stride. I just take my sunglasses off and look the guy right dead in the eye, scan my ticket, and keep going. <laughs> And, and is so JetBlue like, something they usually put you on, or was that something you had to put on your own dime? Oh, no, they, they, they flew me back. They paid for that. Okay. They don't pay for rental cars normally, so that wasn't an unusual thing. It was just kind of an un, – it was a weird situation because I was being sent home early uh, that it was like – and I, I shouldn't have been driving really was my issue with it. And were they sending I, I, you I, home early due to the fact that you were injured, or was this something like, okay, you need to go because there's now a situation they, going on? I think it was a little of both. Uh, I talked to Triple H after the fact. That was when I'd actually requested that Jorge not be punished for it because I felt bad. He's got a kid. I don't want to take food off a kid's plate. Mm-hmm. I don't care what the situation is between me and him. I was like, I, I, and he told me, he was like, yeah, that's, he's like, I respect that, but this isn't the first time this sort of thing's happened, so we have to do something. So you guys ultimately both got fined for that, correct? Yeah. Um, I got, I, I, I was told we got fined the same amount. Uh, I think it was $500. I don't remember exactly. I, I say I think we both got fined the same amount. I don't know we both got fined the same amount. I don't know if you got fined. I know I did. <laughs> but, uh, which is always that awkward part where you're like, I don't want to ask him about that. I certainly don't want to ask him how much he got fined because that's – I don't want to be like, oh, dude, I got fined only 500 for that, huh? And he got fined two grand or something and then you're like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, when oh, you get shit. fined for something like that, does that just come off your payday or is that something you have to actually pay? It just comes out of your paycheck, which I actually, I'd prefer it the other way because at least then I could fight it. Yeah. But if it comes out of your paycheck, there's really nothing you can so do. So is there a line like, item that says find due to, or is it just something just it's a just, deduction? It literally, it literally just says fine. Okay. It, it, it doesn't like go into specifics in the, the fine. Or in on terms the, on of the, fines, that's yeah. something that Carano would come up with or Triple H? or. I, I think it's done through, uh, through Carano. I, he technically is the one who has the final say on it. But I have no idea what it would be like. I don't know what the structure of that would be. I just know Carano's the one usually you talk to stuff like that about. Like he was the one that asked me what the situation was. My immediate reaction was to tell him I fell down some stairs just because I thought I thought that was funny. Um, and then he asked me again. I told him I walked into a door, and then he said, "Tell me you're fired." And I said, "Okay, I'll tell you what happened." So was that was that the only situation say you had with somebody backstage where it, it, it came to? Uh, you know, something like that? Or have you had any other yeah. incidents? No, none. No. And uh, this is not other... Sin Cara's first incident either, though. No, that was his fourth or fifth that was okay. on record. Um, I'd mentioned in another interview that he'd gotten to it with uh, with Wyndham, with Bray Wyatt in developmental. But Wyndham, he's an amateur wrestler. He's 300 pounds. Uh, I, it was the same thing where Jorge tried to cheap shot him and take him down, and Wyndham just basically lateral them, took him right to the mat, laid on top of him, and just refused to move until he calmed down. And the rumor about him being sent to anger management, is that something that you know about? I, I heard that that happened after the thing with Jericho. Um, yeah. Which kind of, I, I, I touched on this in another interview, a lot of the, I, and obviously he can't really talk about the stuff. Obviously not, so, no. But, so. but one, of the, uh, one of the big rumors was always, oh, he's a badass, man. He, talk, he knocks all these guys out. It's like, the only shame is he ran up on him and punched him when he was getting his ankle taped. Mm-hmm. Um, the one with, uh, Jericho is a prime example of kind of what I, of why Jericho shut him down immediately because they're on a bus. So he has to go straight ahead. If he wants to get a Jericho, he mm-hmm. can't come from the side. He can't come from behind. He can't throw something at him. There's nowhere to go. It's a bus. So Jericho immediately shuts him down. And 
what I found out was a lot of the physical altercations he got in were it was exactly that. It was he tried to cheap shot someone or attack him without warning or from behind, whatever, however it was. And then it get, there'd be the pull apart. It was actually kind of if you ever seen uh, Days and Confused, mm-hmm. the guy's whole theory about the no, the if you go to a party, these sort of things. One punch gets thrown, it gets broken up. I'm just gonna get in there, get my one good punch in, go on defense, and just wait until it gets broken up. That's kind of what he did, is that he would use that theory almost. Um, he'd get his one good shot in, even if it didn't actually have all much, all that much impact. The story that gets told is, oh yeah, he knocked this guy out, he's the only one that landed any punches. That was the other thing, it was that whole, uh, he knocked me out with one punch when he didn't throw any punches at all, he threw a Coke can. Mm-hmm. Like, that's, Which ultimately that was, stunned you, cut you, and then from there it was obviously just a break apart. Yeah, okay. so it was... One of those things where, but the at the end of the day, people are gonna people tend to gravitate towards the more, uh, shocking the more, stories, more the, shocking stories. They want to hear the dirt. Story. Yeah, they don't want to hear that. You, you want to hear John Cena's broke. You don't want to hear John Cena works nine hundred thousand hours a week, and sometimes getting around to paying his bills isn't the most prominent thing in his mind because he's legitimately not home. Speaking on the whole Ford scandal right now, I would assume you heard about. Yeah, that. yeah, I and people theorize that he's broke. That's absolutely ludicrous um you know what is the more likely thing he probably didn't pay that much attention when he signed the contract with ford Mm -hmm. and just didn't get that much use out of the car and said fuck it i'll just get rid of it i would almost guarantee that's what it was he didn't even think about it because i know there's a situation uh some years back probably 2012 maybe where a uh he was going and osino was going through i think he was going through a divorce at the time and his wife previously had been taking care of all the bills at home just like actually making sure they get paid out he get he was getting work done on his house. He goes through the divorce. The work's finished, but he's never home to pay the bill. And they, I think, he got sent to collections for it. And it wasn't that he didn't have the money. It was just legitimately he was never home, and he kept forgetting to pay the bill. Interesting. There. Uh, back to but, the Sincara incident. So you and Sincara, you smoothed that out, obviously. As far as I know, I'm still blocked on Twitter from him. But that's. Uh, and. But, that, uh, but like. You know, like after the fact, like shortly thereafter, you guys talk. Like obviously, when you went to the next TV, did you guys, you know, speak to each other, or anything like that? It. Uh, we hugged it out. We talked. You know, I, I complimented him on his throw. I told him he probably missed his calling by not going to baseball. <laughs> um, that was it. Was a dead perfect shot. Like honestly, if it hadn't hurt so bad, I would have been really impressed. It was getting hit in the face of Coke can is not fun. I can yeah. safely tell you that. Um, let's get into you being in a team with Aiden English. The Vaud villains. Uh, would you say that you two became friends after working together for a few years? We got along. This is another one that people had to really jump all over. Because um, I say we weren't really friends, but it's just you're not always going to be friends with everyone you work with, and mm-hmm. it's not necessarily that you have an issue with them. It's just you know your coworkers. You know you do you show up, you do your job, you go home. So you, uh, did you two ride together at all? Uh, when we first got called up, we did, but that was because we were sort of booked in cars together mm-hmm. um you, when you first get on the road the first your 90 days uh when you start out the company still covers your hotels and your rental cars mm-hmm. uh, for some reason they book tag teams together but singles guys get booked in their own car which is to me kind of messed up because it's like hey man i got you know it's no less a bill for me than it is for them that's it mm-hmm. i don't know why <laughs> like book your know, books in our own cars whatever but uh they would have us travel together that was for the most part it um English and I travel two very different ways. That was one thing. He's He sticks to the traditional, uh, right after the show, drive to the next town. Mm-hmm. I may sleep in the same town you're in, drive the next day. I'm, I've been, I night drive, or I used to night drive a lot uh, for wrestling. I don't do it anymore, in big part because I've had too many near car accidents. Mm-hmm. And the way our schedule works, to me, it makes more sense to get out of a show at 11 o'clock at night, go to the hotel, be in bed by midnight, wake up. 8 a.m., have breakfast, go to the gym, drive to the next town, go right to the show, yeah, Uh, and then uh, wrestle. Whereas, uh, because also that's the other thing, you usually have to check out the hotel by 11 a.m., so if you get in at 4 in the morning, 5 in the morning, you're getting three hours of sleep, and then you're going to have all day in a town with nothing to do. Like, I'm, I don't know, yeah, so that's, we, we traveled two different ways, so that was kind of one of the reasons why we didn't really travel together. So who did you, like, after your 90 days was up, uh, it wasn't on the company's tab anymore. You had to take care of your own rentals. Who would you then travel with normally? Uh, 
mostly uh, uh, Apollo Crews and Callisto. Those are the two I like to travel with the most. Uh, once or twice, it'd be like, I think I traveled with Rhino one time. I traveled with Connor once. Uh, but usually it was, uh, usually those two were my favorite people to travel with just because they're really easy to work, to be around. They were relaxed guys. And we heard stories in the past about guys being cheap on the road. Is there anybody that stands out who was really cheap, always wanted to hop in somebody else's car, always, you know, kind of mooched off everybody else when it came to the, the you know, the bill at at the restaurant, anything like that that you that you can speak on? Not that bad. Um, I, I think that's more of an old an old timer thing. You don't really see that much anymore. Uh, most guys are pretty generous nowadays, honestly, with like the travel and stuff. Um, the only one I ever got into it with, and it wasn't a big thing. It was just a, a math thing that pissed me off. Was uh, with uh, Kalisto one time, where so the whole deal was him and Uha uh, had split a room, and Uha had. not or and uh, Manny hadn't paid Uha back for that yet. Or sorry, so Uha hadn't paid Manny back for that. That's what it was. So they split a room, and then there was a night where the three of us shared a room because it was we were only gonna be in the room for a few hours, so it was just, like no reason to get individual rooms. And I think Manny wanted me to pay fifty percent of the room cost because he was covering Uha's part. And mm-hmm. I was like, well, no, that you should be paying two thirds, and I pay one third if you're covering Uha's part for the room because of uh, what he owes you or whatever, or what you owe him. And it took the longest time to explain this to him. Like, he could not wrap his head around this. I was like, look, Manny, if the room was being paid for by all three of us, we'd each be paying 30 bucks. If you're covering Uha's part, I don't, like, you You inherit that 30. I don't pay an extra 15 because Uha's not paying in. That's not how this works. <laughs> so it took me, like, it took me, like, an hour to explain this to him. I finally had to write it down and show him the whole thing. And he just, I don't know if he was fucking with me or he just didn't, or he legitimately didn't get it. But it was that whole thing of, like, no, dude, I don't. If you're covering Uha's part, you're covering a third extra on the room. If you're covering, like, if anything, I'd say you should wait until it's, you know, just the two of you again between the room, or just have Uha pay you back and he pays him to this room. But, like, that was another thing. I was always very specific on let's just split the bill, not you pay for this and I'll pay for that. Like, I, I, I preferred much more, like, well, you know, not you get the rooms this week and I'll get the rooms next week. Like, how about you pay for your room and I pay for my room? Like, just that. And then we split the rental car. So, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the company pays obviously for your your flights. Uh, how far in advance are you getting these tickets for the the flights or bu- bookings you, that you know? Like, what is your schedule generally within a thirty day period? For those who don't know, uh, generally you would get your travel on either Wednesday or, th- or Wednesday or Thursday. So either the day you got home or the day after, and you get your flight information, the show listings, and your tri- your basic travel. If you have to if you have to travel more than 300 miles in a single day, they have to fly you. So what would it often be? Would be like say we're going to uh, I like a normal loop might be uh, Wisconsin to Chicago, or like somewhere in Wisconsin to Chicago, Chicago to St. Louis, St. Louis to Kansas City. Like that'd be a four day loop. So you would fly into Wisconsin, do your show, and Wisconsin travel- would be on the Friday night. Uh, Saturday night usually. Saturday, it was okay. up on the blue loops. It was Saturday to Tuesday, and on the red loops, it was Friday to Monday. Okay. Uh, excuse me, uh, but it was that sort of thing where they uh, you so on the blue loops, which since I was on SmackDown, we'd leave Saturday morning, do the show, or arrive, do the show, go to the next town, then same thing for until uh, TV on Tuesday. Then Tuesday you do TV, Wednesday morning you fly back home. And in terms of when you're getting hotels and rent cars um are you are you know are you are you trying to save money on these types of things are you staying at just you know your simple days in are you trying to you know splurge a little bit which you know are some guys splurging or is for the most part everybody on a budget everybody's pretty reasonable uh like it, it just depends on the guys like um Rollins and uh and Claudio uh, Cesaro they're they're Hilton guys they like staying at Hilton hotels They've got their, their Hilton points and everything. Uh, a lot of guys are Marriott guys. Uh, I, w- I wound up being a Marriott guy, though I wasn't really at first. Um, I, what kind of happens is you, you start off, like, I, I would do the the the, uh, the cheapest motels I could just because I didn't care. I was like, I'm only going to be in for a few hours to sleep anyway. What do I care? But after a while, you know, the the lousy beds, the, you know, that sort of stuff starts to wear on your body. And you're it's worth spending the extra, you know, 20 bucks a night maybe to get a Marriott and have a nice bed, and actually sleep well, and rest up, and actually heal. Uh, the only one I, I will make an exception for is, I don't remember exactly where we were, somewhere in Texas, 
but I booked in a it was a horrible hotel technically, but it was brand new. It was like thirty dollars a night. <laughs> So, so I was like, oh, yeah, I'll take that. I'll get, like, three nights there because it was just the way the shows worked out. I, it was like, they were, like, only 90 miles apart. They weren't that long. So uh, that was, that's one of my rules. I'll drive a maximum of 90 minutes after a show. I won't, I won't drive more than that. But uh, that one was I, – I just I, – I was like, okay, I'll do, the, I'll do this one three nights in a row. It'll be fine. But it turned out it just happened to be a new hotel, so I, it wasn't that bad. But a lot of the time, if you go that cheap, you're going to wind up at the Roche Motel, and you just kind of got to deal with it. But I wound up sort of morphing into the Marriott way of life, and uh, still like staying at Marriotts. Honestly, they're really comfortable hotels. It's uh, they don't pay me anything to say that, but I wish they would. <laughs> um, and some guys, they still, they still, you know, obviously travel on the or you know have accommodations on the the company's dime. Uh, does guy, how many guys out there still have a bus? Does Randy Orton still have his bus? Uh, Orton does. I think it's Orton Show. Um, and uh, Cena, I think, are the only ones that do at this point. Now, Triple H has a bus, but he, he's his is really not as regularly used just because he's flying so much. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, you know, the, the WWE does have their private plane and stuff. Have you ever had a chance to jump on the plane at all? No. Uh, I've done some charter flights, uh, particularly in Europe. Uh, you get those a lot. But uh, other than that, no. Nah. And in terms of um, backstage... Do you, you know, the atmosphere there, uh, what was the clicks like backstage? Not necessarily like, you know, your attitude era type clicks, but which guys like to hang out together, which guys would, would, you know, obviously be more clicky in the, in the back. Would you see like, sort of the, the 205 guys all together, the women all together? Would you see guys like Cena and Orton off on their own? How was the atmosphere back there? Uh, it varies, honestly. Um, two or five live guys, for the most part, were always around each other, just because they usually had a lot of the same stuff to do. Um, Orton's usually by himself. He'll hang out with random people, but he's generally by himself. Cena's busy. Like Cena is just uh, he's got eight million things to do, so yeah. he's you rarely see him. Uh, when you do, he's always very polite and friendly. You know, there's never anything. You know, guys never had a bad day in his life, <laughs> but uh, but. Um, the women, once again, like, yeah, it just depends. Like, you, people usually break off with who they're close to, um, who they hang out with, who they travel with. Uh, like, a lot of the, old, like, if you're an older FCW guy, like, the, like, uh, Vic and Connor, uh, they tend to hang out with, like, uh, Harper and Rowan and, uh, um, Keith Slater, you know, those guys, like, the people you've been around for a long time. Uh, New Day hangs out all together. Um, uh, things like that. It's really, it's kind of who you'd expect, I guess is a better way to put it. And, and who's like, Aiden I, English hanging out with since, you know, he's not a part of your group there. Who's who's he gravitating towards? He doesn't say more like Ty, like Ty Dillinger, Sami Zayn, guys like that. Like a lot of the like a lot of the old FCW guys that he started out with. Are those tend to be more the ones he gravitates towards? I tended to hang out with like I said more just. I, I got along with a lot of the two or five live guys. I love Spanky to death, uh, Brian Kendrick, um, Rich Swan, great guys, Jack Gallagher, great guy. Um, Guys like that, I you know, like I said I hung out with Uha, hung out with Manny, but uh, every once in a while I'd sit, I'd uh, chat with Bray Wyatt because we got along. Uh, we actually bonded of all things over a mutual love of the band Gogo Bordello. Okay, I'm aware of the oh, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, horror movies, and of all things, we both absolutely love Monster Chono. Okay, who cannot so, love so for those of you, those, <laughs> oh yeah, those of you, for those of you who don't know, listening to this, Monster Chono, um, huge star in Japan. He uh, actually was like the, one of the last students of uh, Luthez. And when he came over to the U.S., he actually would stay because uh, he was really tight with uh, Captain Mike, with uh, uh, Mike Rotundo, uh, IRS, Wyatt's whatever dad. you want to call him, yeah. uh, Bray Wyatt's dad. Mm -hmm. So he would come over and stay with the with uh, the Rotunda family when he was in the U.S. So Bray grew up around him. And he, he, you know, he'd always bring – because uh, his wife's a fashion designer and stuff. Uh, Chono's wife is like a Swedish fashion designer. I think it's uh, uh, Artrista or something like that is like his fashion label that he actually has in Japan. So he had all these shirts and jeans and stuff from Japan. He didn't know what they were. Just, Uncle Chono gave them to me. <laughs> so – and it just came up one day. As I just mentioned Master Chono. He's like, I love Chono. <laughs> and it was just – and we just would talk about Chono and horror movies. So it was, it'd be, it was just a fun thing to bond over. Um, and then – with some of the bigger guys on the roster, like your Cena's, like your Orton's, obviously they would be busy. But did you did they, were they still one of the boys in the back mingling with everybody? Oh yeah, more um, 
Cena was when he was around. It was just that he was always so busy. Uh, Orton absolutely was, but he's he's just Randy. Just Randy being Randy. You mentioned Sami Zayn before. I'm, I'm pretty sure you're probably aware of Zayn and Owens um, having the incident um, a few weeks ago on SmackDown. No, what incident? Uh, there was an incident where they were supposed to basically feed for the new day. They were supposed to, you know, take a beating. They left the ring. They didn't take the beating. And they got sent home um, from the tour in the UK. Oh, uh, okay. Um, if you I think I think actually I think I did I think I did actually hear about that. Yeah. I, I'm just wondering. Some people are saying the guys like Sammy in the back. He's very hard to read. Sometimes almost uh, a little bit blunt, a little bit annoying. Have you seen any of that? There are times Sammy does things that I think uh, I think he take I think he sometimes takes for granted that he's very well liked. And sometimes that affects him poorly. There was one thing that happened that I remember pissed a lot of guys off in developmental. Well, there was this thing we used to call the the Rammy talk, which was just something he would do. He would like talk to people about the importance of respecting the business and a lot of stuff like that. And there was one time it was him and uh, Big Cass, and they had this. It was before a PC show. Now PC shows are basically in in PC events done mm-hmm. just for the wrestlers. To get like in ring experience as sort of a, a mock audience, so it's just other wrestlers watching. And uh, before the PC show, he calls uh, him and Cass call us in, and they have the the Rammy talk more or less about you know the importance of respecting the business, da, 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 this whole the whole nine yards. And then they cut out early to go see Bruce Springsteen. Okay, which kind so of everyone else had to, it. <laughs> yeah, everyone else had to had to stay and watch the PC show. And part of the the thing that I think pissed people off was. Normally would have had like an hour to go get lunch or, or to get like some food or something before the PC show started. Because of the Rammy talk, we didn't get that. Ah. Uh. So I think that kind of that that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way because it was I think he took for granted they're like oh guys I'm Rammy you know I respect the business come on it's okay and it's like dude you can't stand up there and tell us all this stuff and then bail to go see the boss I mean I get it it's Springsteen I understand. You know, it's a, it's a once it might be you know who knows how so many opportunities you're gonna have to see Springsteen, but at the same time, it, it does look it's a bad look for you to, to give that speech and then turn around and do that. So it's I, I could see why I could see how he might do something like that that would rub people the wrong way. It's not that he, he's a bad guy. It's just sometimes like I say he takes it's it's like he takes for granted that he's he's well liked and doesn't understand that he can still piss people off. Okay, um, now here's one thing, and you've been critical in the past, Enzo Amore. There's been stories about him being kicked off tour buses by Roman Reigns, told to leave locker rooms. Do you have any stories regarding Enzo Amore backstage and maybe the reason why people might not, might not be too fond of him? I know you've been very critical about him in the past. Give us some more insight onto what's up with Enzo Amore backstage. Well, a lot of it is I, basically the a person's personality will come out more when they think they're bulletproof. If you think you can do no wrong, that's when you're going to be honest, and that's sometimes when you play your hand. I I freely, I, I don't really hide my personality from people. I am who I am. I don't try and politic. I don't try and make nice with guys just so they'll like me. I, and that may have been to my detriment professionally, but I'm not here to make you feel good about yourself. That's not why you hired me. I'm, I'm here to do my job. It doesn't mean I'm going to be rude or mean or unpleasant, but if you're expecting me to sit there and kiss your ass for 45 minutes just so you'll listen to what my idea is, I'm not going to do that. That's just not me. It's not in my nature to, to do that sort of thing. I'm not a politician. I never have been. Enzo is the type of guy who goes out of his way to politic, but he only politics as long as he thinks he has to. Mm-hmm. Like He'll be nice to you as long as he thinks it's to his, uh, to his uh, advantage to do so. Um, <clears throat> it was one of the things I remember seeing was when uh, Fergal, when Finn first showed up, uh, Enzo immediately made it a point to buddy up to him. And he's telling him, yeah, bro, you know, you want to get chicks, you got to, like, move downtown, live downtown. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that, that Great Enzo, Enzo impression, by the way. Continue. It, it's, very, it's very stressful on the vocal cords. Um, <laughs> but uh, he's telling him this to Finn, like, yeah, you want to get chicks, you got to move, live downtown, man. You get all, there are all the bars down there, you can walk to the bars. And all I'm thinking is, okay, Finn was a model for Armani in Japan. That was an actual side gig he had when he was over there. He is handsome guy. He's got nine million abdominal muscles. He's got the Irish accent. 
that, that guy could go to a Buddhist monastery in the highest point in Tibet where there are nothing but men and he could still pull chicks. Like he does, he does not need pointers from a guy whose biggest career highlight was working as a dishwasher at a Hooters. You know, it's like that's that's not the person who should be giving him advice on women. So, but like I said, that was his whole thing. He went out of his way to make friends with Finn right off the get go. But he was doing it because politically he knew that would be a good move. He wasn't doing it just out of out of sheer, you know, hey, this guy's cool. We're getting to know each other. We get along. And that's kind of his way. He's very much a, a manipulative person. It's very obvious to people, I think, that that's what he does. So when it becomes apparent when he thinks he's hot shit and he's, oh, I'm making all this money and I'm so over, everyone loves me. Dude, you got to remember, your, your, your whole deal is kind of – got a short lifespan. Like that's the thing to me is uh, different isn't always good, but good is always good. And if you're a good wrestler, you can always fall back on that. If you're a good talker, admittedly, the thing with talkers is if they don't have a good match to back it up, people will start to get bored eventually if they're talking. The bell, I have one of my favorite sayings is the bell has to ring. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, no matter what angle or vignette or promo, whatever appears before the match, sooner or later that bell will ring. And if you cannot get it done inside the ring, you are going to fall short. And there are a lot of people that will look at like, oh, what about Roman Reigns? Like, Roman is actually a good wrestler. You can't see that because you're blinded by your hatred for his push, which if you would actually just let go, you would see he has some incredibly entertaining matches. But if you legitimately can't follow through with a good match, like... Not to knock on the guy, but like Hogan 2007, or you know when he was in TNA, whatever year that was. Mm-hmm. When he was at the point where all he could really do was fall down and bleed. There's a point where you have to say, look, I shouldn't be excited when I hear your music and then sad when the bell rings. Because I know what, it, what the match is going to be. And he falls in that category where he isn't a good wrestler. We're talking about so, Enzo, not Roman here, by the way. Yeah, not Roman, no, Enzo. Yeah. <laughs> so, where, so, so you're in that position where because he can't really get it done in the ring... But he thought for years by just if his if people liked his promos and if he was friends with everybody he'd do fine and to a certain extent he has he's definitely made, making a good living. It's just there's going to be that shelf life on it and if you start rubbing people the wrong way, as often guys do when they start to think they're above the rules or above the law, you're gonna you know you're gonna be gone. You're gonna be in that position where sooner or later people aren't gonna want to work with you. People aren't going to want to have you around, and eventually, you know, being the the party guy is going to be really silly looking when no one wants to party with you. You know, is is he one of like the the main party animals backstage? Because judging by just looking at him on social media, he's always out and about. He's at the club. He's at this you know place. Is he like the main party guy backstage? No, that's Mojo. That's Mojo. Okay, yeah, I forgot Mojo. Yeah, no, Mojo should no yeah. one. Yeah, no yeah. one on earth parties like Mojo Rowley. No one. The man is inhuman. It's amazing. <laughs> and getting back to Enzo, have you witnessed anything where, say, Enzo's been uh, told to like, leave, leave a locker room or kicked off a bus or anything like that? The only one I ever saw, it wasn't anything like that, um, but Enzo was trying to, was was talking about uh, when he broke his leg in developmental. When we uh, again, this was tribute to the troops. That uh, that was the other. That was the one I remember specifically because this was after uh, the brand split. Because I know Capital Punishment was before it. Tribute was after. Um, so tribute to the troops is happening. We're in DC, and Enzo's talking about how uh, Callisto broke his leg when they were in developmental. And Manny, who's the nicest guy in the world, like Callisto, is an absolute sweetheart. Anyone who has a bad thing to say about him is a complete liar and a jerk. Um, so Manny goes, no, motherfucker, you broke your leg because you don't know how to wrestle. Like, Manny just straight called him out. Is this when he was in the wheelchair? Yeah, um, he, here's the thing. Some people said that he claimed he caught his foot in the canvas, or he blamed his shoes for it, the thing, or his boots for it. The reason he blamed his boots was at the time, Bill DeMott had a rule that if you wrestled in, first of all, he wanted everyone to wrestle in boots. Mm-hmm. And he said, if you wrestle in, if you train him, if you wrestle in boots, you train in boots. So when Enzo broke his leg... He claimed he actually had a doctor write a note. He bragged about this in the locker room, stating that he should not be training in wrestling boots anymore. He should be training in sneakers. Oh, uh, so is that how he got to wear the sneakers or what? Yeah, and that was how he got it. He'd already at that point started wearing sneakers in the ring, but he was still required to wear boots when he trained. Okay. In the same way Rusev had, tra- had to train in boots, even though at the time he was wrestling barefoot. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
the whole reason he claimed it was he uh, the boot that caused him to break his leg was purely a, a maneuver to avoid having to wear boots in training ever again. Wow. Yeah, yeah. In the same way, he uh, like as a lot of the time, this is this is what you have to consider is that because I there have been people who claimed, oh, I've heard Enzo say this. Like, yeah, he said both things. That's what you have to remember. So he'll say he'll tell different versions of the story. Sometimes he's very honest, and sometimes he lies. I've sat in a room, me, him, and Becky Lynch doing social media training, and heard him straight up lie about how Triple H found his uh, promo video online. And then there've been other interviews where he said honestly how he did it. That was the that was tri- like the same trainer who sent it to yeah. Triple H, though. Yeah, Joe DeFranco. Yeah, yeah that was. So- but depending on what version of the story you hear, the one he told that day, he told him that Triple H found it online himself. He did not say that Joe DeFranco sent it to him. Okay. Um, talking about social media training real quick, um, how, how does that work? Because uh, there is, you know, obviously incidents that happen online between on Twitter. Some of it's obviously a work, but there are incidents, especially like the recent thing with Leo Rush. Uh, walk us through how social media training works. Generally, the basic rule is uh, don't engage with trolls. Uh, don't say anything. Don't try not to comment on anything, shall we say, of a sensitive nature. Be conscious of what you're talking about when you talk about it. Like one of the examples they gave was uh, Ashton Kutcher, the actor. He is a uh, Pitt fan. Uh, uh, whatever it is, uh, Pittsburgh University, whatever it is. Um, is it Pittsburgh or is it Pennsylvania? I can't remember. Where, where everyone Joe Paterno was a coach at. So he heard about Joe Paterno getting fired. He did not know Joe Paterno was fired because of multiple allegations of him molesting young boys. So he's complaining about them firing Joe Paterno without knowing why they fired him. Mm. So there's a huge social media backlash, like, you're defending a pedophile. He's like, wait, what? He's a pedophile? He had no idea what was going on. And part of what they're saying is, like, be mindful of what you're commenting on before you comment on it. It's like it's one. It's like it's it's not necessarily about don't comment on things that are controversial, but understand the potential backlash. Be careful of how you, how you phrase things, what you say, what you talk about, because... It can very easily be misinterpreted. There's no, I mean, it's easy to misinterpret writing. Mm-hmm. When you hear someone speak, people can rarely get it right. Like I, I do find it interesting that, as I mentioned earlier, the whole thing with these. Uh, excuse me, I'm very gassy. I, I'm drinking a, I'm drinking a Sprite Zero in honor of Jim Cornette. Nice. Uh, but, uh, Double onions. <laughs> oh, it's gotta, gotta go to the gotta go to the uh, what is Dairy, it the Dairy, Dairy Queen after this. See see if I can get myself banned. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, the whole thing with like uh, with a lot of the social media stuff is like uh, try to be conscious because you'll say things sometimes are taken out of context. The example I was going to use was I'll give these I'll do these interviews on the podcast and everything, and someone will write up a uh, a uh, a transcript and they'll get a lot of stuff wrong. Mm-hmm. One in one case uh, when I was telling the story about Enzo knocking himself out. Uh, I mentioned the referee Rudy Charles in the transcript that says Charles Robinson. Oh, okay. They're, they're different guys. Mm-hmm. Um, in the same way, there was one where I mentioned a uh, a shoot interview I did where I mentioned a uh, promo I'd never gotten to use that I always had in my back pocket calling Enzo about being everything about him being fake. And it was posted as though this was actually my opinion of Enzo and not a promo. Mm-hmm. So it's stuff like that where it's very easy to take something out of context, especially in writing. But that's their big point with social media is why you have to be mindful of what you say and when you say it. The Leo Rushing is a good example of that. That's the sort of joke you would make to the boys and they probably, they probably laugh at. Mm-hmm. It's inappropriate. It's in bad taste. It's sad. Someone lost their job. Yes, this is all true. But at the end of the day, people in wrestling make very poor taste in jokes in poor taste. Uh, to give you a, uh, an example of some friends of mine, um, a couple of guys that trained me, uh, Mike or Donovan Morgan and uh, Frank Murdoch, they were actually really tight with Crash Holly. Okay. At the time Crash passed away, he was actually supposed to move out to California. He was going to invest in the school they had, and he was going to come on as a trainer. He he died two days before he was supposed to show up. And Mike and Donovan had known him for years, or uh, Donovan and Frank had known him for years, and they were sitting in the office one day drinking, and they're just in silence. And Frank, without even looking at Donovan, just goes, "Well, I guess we're going to have to fire Crash." Oh wow. And there's this moment of silence where Donovan's looking at him and just cracks and starts laughing his ass off. It was the most inappropriate and dark, just 
horrible joke you could make, but it was that thing of we're dealing with grief. Grief isn't easy to deal with, and sometimes being able to laugh at the absurdity of it all helps. Mm-hmm. So Leo's joke absolutely was in, it was in totally poor taste. It was like I said, it's the sort of thing guys might say back and forth, just sort of dealing with the you know the the horrible nature of it. It would be like, oh dude, that's fucked up. Yeah, with the other boys what, backstage, something yeah. like that, not on on Twitter. Yeah, it's when you do it in public, you're kind of putting her on blast, and mm. it's fair to see why that would have upset people, you know. Um, and it, go ahead. I was saying, even then, doing it in the locker room is not always going to go over well. <laughs> yeah, that's the I other thing. It you have to consider who's in the locker room with you at the time. Yeah, so yeah, who's in the locker room? Who, what their relationship? Because if it's someone that doesn't like Emma, they might laugh their ass off at it. If it's someone that was close with her, you know, they're going to get hurt. They're going to be upset because mm-hmm. even if you didn't like her, it was like that's someone losing their job. That's never a good thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, one other person, uh, James Ellsworth. Did you have any time to spend with him? I know that obviously on television he was you know, uh, quote-unquote a bit of a joke, but how was he backstage? I know he's been in the business for quite some time. I love Jimmy. I, I absolutely adore that guy. I um, I actually noticed him as an extra. This was, uh, I think we were in Baltimore. That's where uh, he's from, right? Baltimore? Yeah, it was Baltimore, Maryland. And that's also where uh, Styx, the referee, uh, is from. So I'm looking at him because he, him, all the extras usually sit in the, uh, in the audience. I'm looking at him like, Dude, that guy has no chin. What the, he has no lower jaw. What's going on? And I kept. I was like, I kept asking. Does anyone know who he is? I just kept asking about it, and finally they were like, Yeah, Sticks knows him. And I was like, Dude, Sticks, what's his deal? He's like, a wrestler. So I was like, What's up with this? Why doesn't he have a jaw? He's like, Just how he looks. He's like, Dude, I was just sort of, I was just blown away by it. And sure enough, he winds up coming back. I think we were back to the area, not Baltimore, but somewhere around there. He did the thing with Braun, and they signed him. And it was the same thing where Vince saw him. And he was like, he's the most different looking person he'd ever seen. He's like, I have to have him. And that was essentially what got him his job. Was he just looked so different? No one could. It was like, you're not going to see a second guy that looks like that. Mm-hmm. And he was always you know, an upbeat, happy guy. I think the worst thing I could say about him was I think he was trying so hard to like not piss anyone off okay. that sometimes, like there was, there was a like we were on tour in in Europe. Everyone's like, drink, you got to drink with us. We're on the bus, you got to drink. He's like, no, I don't want to get drunk. No, 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 thank you. Like he's being a, a polite young man. It's like, ah, oh, fuck this guy. He's not getting drunk with us. But it was that whole thing of, he's trying to do the right thing. But it's like, dude, sometimes you just gotta cut loose. People want to see you get drunk and have fun. So you like, didn't want to ruffle any feathers. Yeah, but it, he, it was. It's from a good place. So like, he's not doing it for that reason. It's just that sometimes, sometimes like no, they're asking you to drink. They really do want you to drink with them. Like it's almost more of an insult to say no. Just take the drink, you know. Um, a lot of fans of uh, our YouTube channel are fans of. WWE action figures and the 2K series of video games. What's the process like of getting, say, scanned for an action figure of the game? Uh, can you provide some insight on how that all works? Uh, they have an actual machine for scanning the face. And, uh, that comes basically... backstage? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, it's a traveling machine. Mm-hmm. When we did ours, uh, we actually got scanned for all of our stuff in NXT. And part of the reason for that was it, it was the Wyatt family that caused this. The Wyatt family was called up so quickly that uh, when they made it to TV, they did not have action figures. They did not have T-shirts. They had nothing. They had no merch. So, and the, the lead time you need on those action figures can be like six months. Mm-hmm. So you wind up with the, the Wyatt family who are on all these angles. They're on all this, all this TV, and no one can buy an action figure of them for six months. So what happened with that was they made a conscious effort to start scanning all the guys in NXT early. So if they needed to call them up, they could and have a figure ready quicker. So they, uh, you basically sit in a chair. They'll tell you to make certain, you know, first they'll do a scan where it's just don't move. Then they do another scan, like make a facial expression like this, make an angry face, make a, you know, like you're yelling, you know, open mouth, closed mouth, smile, frown, things like that. Then that takes, you know, maybe like 20 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it is. Then they'll do a bunch of, uh, Shot photo shots or photos of your body and your gear. They'll do like close ups and stuff to get little details. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's all just passed along to the art departments for the video game companies and for the uh, action figures, and they could take it from there. So these are two sides like Mattel's coming in for the action figures, and obviously 2K's coming in for the games. Um, two, two totally separate things there when you're getting scanned. Oh, yeah, but you're, it's the same scan, so that's the thing. Oh, so they're, u- like- they're using the same scan that's that's being used. Okay. Yeah, like the I think 2K actually does a lot of it off photos too, 
So the, fo- the the reference photos are basically just sent to them. The scans are the same thing, you know? Okay. And in terms of, uh, I don't know how, like, you know, we don't need to get into specific figures here. Uh, there is, you know, it is known that the NXT guys sometimes get a short of the deal when it comes to merchandising versus the main roster guys. Things like action figures, video games. Uh, how how different is the deals in terms of royalties when, say, you have an action figure as an NXT guy or you're in the video game as an NXT guy versus once you even hit the main roster? Uh, actually, for the uh, merchandise, it's exactly the same. It's 5%. Okay. The standard deal for anyone under a WWE contract for merchandise is 5%. If you are in a multi-man, shall we say, unit, a tag team, whatever, you get uh, – it's basically – split. that 5% is split amongst the members – uh, excuse me for one second. Uh, sorry about that. No worries. Um, uh, the uh, so for example, like me and me in English, we got we each got two and a half percent of our uh, t-shirt sales because the t-shirt represented both of us. Whereas the Wyatt family would have gotten you know thirty three percent each. Okay, and, and that would be the uh, same for the action figures as well. Uh, yeah, action figures, same thing. We get five uh, percent. We get five percent for that as well, I believe. And I think that's a standard across the board for all merch. The video game is a separate thing because you're actually not paid by WWE for that. You're paid by 2K. So um, in the case of the 2K thing, you get a flat rate and then uh, royalties after that. Based And that's all based on the game sales. Um, like, I know with the uh, – because I was actually – I don't know if anyone else talked about that. I, was, I know I talked about that in the last interview I did about uh, the NXT guys for the video game this past time through, and it was just because there were so many people, I think this was the largest roster they've ever had, it was almost two, I think it was about 200 guys. It's or 200, 200 people guys. on the roster, yeah. 200 people, yeah. So, I believe, or give or take. What they told the guys who were going to be the DLC for the NXT stuff was you have two choices, you can accept three grand and no royalties, or not be in the game. Now, that was, I think them and the 205 Live the guys 205, got the That's what I did hear about 205 Live guys, they just got a, a flat fee and there was no royalties attached to it. And then obviously the main roster guys got whatever the legends, they have their own contract. But then yeah. when you were in the say you were in 2k 16 or 17, 16 and 17. And actually we got paid the standard rate. I got paid the same amount for 16 as for 17 actually. And you're still which getting was royalties on that as well. Yes. Yeah. I, I just got, I don't know if I'll get them again uh, because obviously the video games, the promise of the video game sales are going to be within the first three months, mm-hmm. and then there'll be the secondary, like the uh, bargain bin type sales for the for the uh, second three months. You rarely see anything after that, and if you do, it's like a couple hundred bucks. It's not really a whole lot, but yeah. And as far as the the royalties goes for things like the the DVDs and things like that, because that's one thing that um, somebody like Austin Aries was talking about being not on the WrestleMania DVD. On, I don't know. It, it, like I know he, that was the thing that's been said. I don't know how much money that would actually work out to, to be perfectly honest. Mm-hmm. Um, just because, obviously, I was only on one WrestleMania. And you were on the, in the Battle Royal. In the Battle Royal, yeah. And that was not going to be on the DVD anyway, so I'm not going to pay for that. But uh, <laughs> it's that sort of thing where I couldn't really speak to the amount of money that he would have theoretically made off the DVD. DVD sales are so almost passe that I feel like that's kind of a uh, moot point nowadays. I, I think if I think that was probably what a lot of people latched on to, but I feel like it was kind of like I don't know about this. Uh, are you familiar with the uh, Fantastic the last Fantastic Four movie they did, the Josh yeah. Trake one? Yeah. There were a host of things people complained about in that movie, but some people only focused on Black Johnny Storm. That was the only thing they got upset about. It's like there's actually that's pretty much the least wrong thing with this movie. That's probably the if you're gonna like you're gonna jump on anything in this movie, you could jump on the fact that how about for starters, they're all like twelve years old <laughs> when Reed Richards looked like he was about forty seven in in the comic book, and they're supposed to be astronauts, and now all of a sudden they're traveling to a different dimension. And all of a sudden, you're like, there's so much wrong with this movie. Like, I, I feel like a lot of people le- latched on the Black Johnny Storm thing because it was something that could be rallied around as like controversial for people. To, you know, it's like, oh, you know, because if you're if you're one of those diehard comic book nerds who freaks out when you change anything, no, they're changing the comic book. This isn't right. Or you can go from the other side of where it's, oh, you're racist because you're complaining about them changing this. Mm-hmm. I think it's kind of the same thing where it's like that was probably one thing Austin Aries was mad about. And that's the one everyone talks about. But I don't think that was the entirety of what his point was. Because okay. even something as simple as about like the merchandising deals where you're getting 5% of your merch. So you're keeping 95%. 
but you're only and you could argue, oh well, you're only able to sell this shirt because you're on WWE TV. It's like, yes, but you only have a shirt to sell because I exist. If I didn't exist, you wouldn't have this shirt to sell. Mm-hmm, definitely. So maybe so maybe five, a little more than five percent would be reasonable. But I, I think there's probably a lot more to him wanting his release than just that. That's just the thing that everyone has heard, so they just repeat it. Interesting. Okay, I, I you know, and uh, Austin Aries. I'm actually, I believe I'm going to be interviewing him in a couple weeks as he before he faces Pete Dunne at the Destiny uh, show in Mississauga, Canada. So hopefully get a little bit more insight there. Uh, let's walk you through, I know it's probably not something you like talking about, the release. When you were released by the WWE, you worked the WrestleMania Battle Royal, and then I believe you worked a dark match the day before you were released? Yes, that is correct. Uh, if you don't mind, walk us through that whole process when you found out uh, what was going on there um, with the release. Uh, <clears throat> literally, I got uh, I got email or I got the phone call uh, Wednesday. I I missed the call. I never have my ringer on because I just I don't see a point to it. Um, so I was I just gone out for Korean barbecue at uh, Izzy Bon, a lovely restaurant in uh, Orlando. If you're ever down here, I highly recommend it. Okay. Uh, and uh, got home, I watched the first episode of Season 2 of Attack on Titan. And I, I looked at my phone, I saw I had a missed call from Mark Carano. I was 203 like, oh. number, you probably saw? Oh yeah, I very specifically said because I had his number in my phone, okay. so I said Mark Carano. And I was like, oh. I was like, well, there's only one reason Carano's probably calling me. I'd asked him about because I'd uh, got my schedule for the rest of the, for the post-WrestleMania, and I was on like nothing. And I was really, I was mad about that, and I told him. I was like, dude, I, I'm not making any money if I'm not on anything. Come on, you got to put me on something. Mm-hmm. He's like, okay, I'll take care of it. Don't worry. So I was like, well, I'm either getting fired. Or I'm getting told they got me on stuff, but I don't think I'm getting. I don't think it's a ladder. I think I'm getting fired. So he talked. I called him back. Uh, he said, look, uh, Vince feels your character's run its course. We would like to exercise our right to uh, to um, terminate your contract. I went, okay. And that was it. That was it. And then from there, um, there was obviously wording in your contract that said you had a 90-day no-compete clause if you were, say, t- if the if the contract was ended prematurely. Yeah. Like, when was your contract supposed to end? I had a three-year, de- I had a three-year deal, um, so it would have been two years after that. So it ended 2017, so it would have been 2019. 2019. So then you had the no- 90-day no-compete clause did they specifically tell you, okay, you know, we're going to, you know, pay you your downside and, you know, you, you know, you can call us if you wanted to make appearances or were they very specific saying, okay, you can't work anywhere for 90 days. By the way, you can't use the Simon Gotch name either. Uh, they never mentioned the, uh, not using the name. Honestly, they, uh, that never came up. They did, uh, they did tell me if I had any book, I couldn't do any shows for 90 days because as I was still technically under contract mm-hmm. until the 90 day no compete is up. Um, if I get injured, for example, uh, on a wrestling show, that technically falls back on them to take care of. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's why they don't want you doing that. So I, uh, I would call them if I had like a signing or a video or an appearance or something like that, or a uh, someone wanted to book me for something like that, a uh, convention, whatever, and uh, they would either approve it or not. Um, and did they disapprove after, any anything? The only one they disapproved of, I can't remember what it was for, but it was like a convention, but it was literally like the week I got released. Okay, so right away. Right, they were that was the one they weren't comfortable with, but all the other ones they were fine with. Um, like any podcast or anything like that, I had to run by them too. Um, they just asked that I not, you know, they was like, be smart. And I was like, dude, I'm, I'm not dumb. I know what I'm going to say. It's I'm not going to blast the company. There's nothing mm-hmm. to be gained by that. Yeah. But, uh, but they didn't mention anything yeah, they, about the name. No, they never mentioned me, anything to me about the name. Uh, Which is interesting I, uh, that the WWE actually, with the trademark of the Simon Gotch name, they abandoned that trademark. So technically, I guess you could apply for it. I technically could. I don't want it, though. So you would rather just use the Simon Grimm name, make your name as Simon Grimm, and then go from there? Kind of. Uh, honestly, my, my issue with it, this is kind of a personal thing. Part of what I'm doing right now is proving a point. Mm-hmm. Um, that for a company that treated me like a worthless gimmick, that I was there to 
be a clown and make people laugh and that was it, uh, that I'm actually a very talented wrestler. And that's not always the easiest thing to convince people of. So now when I go out there and I have, you know, a kick-ass 15-minute match with Tom Lawler um, in what, or in uh, Oregon, or I go to England, I wrestle Matt Riddle or Daisuke Sakamoto or Doug Williams, and I have great matches with these guys, I don't want it to be that I'm enhancing the image of WWE. I want it to be that I'm enhancing my image. I want people to look at me and go, oh, wow, you're doing this, not, oh, hey, there's that guy from WWE. Okay. I Something it was, even though the, the actual circumstances of it, how it happened uh, were pretty messed up, something I always respected uh, was Johnny the Bull Stamboli. When he left WWE, uh, he completely changed his whole deal and started doing this gimmick of uh, Red Rum, where it was like a, he came up in TNA and he was, he was under the name Relic, which was Killer spelled backwards. But on the Indies before that, he was doing the Red Rum gimmick. And I just remember thinking, you know what, that's gutsy. That's It'd be very easy for him to just do Johnny the Bull Stamboli for one WCW, WWE Superstar every night for every garbage little indie in central Pennsylvania or southern Alabama or wherever and just milk that for all it's worth. But he did the exact opposite. I was like, no, I'm going to build something, uh, and it will be different. I'm going to show that I have more to offer than just the fact that I was in WCW or in WWE. And that's kind of what I'm doing now is just proving that point that I'm. you saw me for four years, but you never actually saw me. You saw what I was being told to do by the office based on a character that I come up with that they misunderstood, and I had to perform in a fashion that they approved of. Mm-hmm. And do you find this is now a blessing in disguise almost that, you know, you're back on the indie scene. Uh, it's almost like a rejuvenation of the independence. A lot of people are talking about the independence. You see guys like Cody Rhodes and the Young Bucks and all those guys. Um, are, are, are Do you see this as a blessing in disguise? I do, actually. I, I'm honestly I'm a lot happier. <laughs> I was pretty well miserable my entire time there. So this has actually been really relaxing and uh Thing. I've been able to rediscover my love of wrestling, which is something I didn't have for quite a while while I was there. It was very, it had become very much a job, uh, and that I wasn't a fan of. And on a side note, let me let me tell you a story, mm-hmm. just because I never tell this story, and it's one of my favorite stories. And I got to confirm it with him recently uh, at Ring of Honor. So, about a year, and a, a little over a year ago. WWE was, we were gearing up to do a tour of Hawaii and Japan. We were going to do uh, basically a show in Hawaii, two, two shows in Japan, and then fly back for TV. I, I love Japanese wrestling. Japan's the only place I've ever wanted to wrestle. I've never, like, it's never been a goal to work full-time in the U.S., so it's been a goal to work full-time in Japan. That was always my dream. So I'm excited. I'm more excited than I've been for every, anything. So I'm going to finally get to go and wrestle in Japan. It might not be how I wanted it to be, but at least I get to do it once. We're in Tampa on a house show. Uh, it's like a four-way tag match or something like that with us, the uh, New Day, Lucha Dragons, and I think maybe uh, Slater and Rhino or uh, – or uh, I'm not sure who it is. So we're going through the match. There's a whole shotgun series at the end when uh, I'm supposed to get kicked with the uh, Trouble in Paradise. I bail out of the ring after that. I come back in to break up uh, – Sorry about that. We cut out. Yeah, no worries. Um, where was I? When I cut um, out? you were you, the end of the match in Tampa. Okay, so the so the kick. So uh, we're doing the whole shotgun series, and uh, I'm supposed to eat the trouble in paradise. I, I don't get my hand up, and so Kofi kicks me square in the head, and I go down. And Rudy Charles, the referee, comes to check on me because this is like the hardest I've ever been kicked in my life, and this is like work and shoot. This is the hardest kick I've ever eaten. So I go down hard. And I don't know, like, I don't know if I got knocked out. Like, I'm actually unsure of it because it was that hard to kick. So Rudy comes to check on me. He goes, are you okay? And I go, I'm fine. Where are we? And he responds with, you don't know where we are? And I meant where are we in the match because I didn't know if I'd missed anything. Because, mm-hmm. like I said, I wasn't sure if I'd gone out. And I was like, no, where are we in the match? I, I was like, I got to break up the pin. I got to break up the swan talk. I was like, we're in Tampa. I know where we are. And he goes, no, you're out of the match. I'm like, Okay, so they pull me out. They're checking me for a concussion and everything. They send me home, uh, and they're like, "Look, we'll we'll test you at TV, or we'll te- we'll uh, we'll give you a test at TV. We'll see how you're doing." And I'm like, literally begging the doctor. I'm like, "Please don't take me off Japan. Please, this is all I'm just anything. Just don't take me off Japan." 
He's like, look, we have to check you at TV. We'll see how you're doing. Okay. I was like, all right. I drive home from to Orlando from Tampa. I get a text message from Larry, uh, who's one of the, the trainers, and all it says is, how's your headache? And I said, same as it was before I left Larry, non-existent, because I knew he was checking to see if I had, if I remembered that I told him I didn't have a headache. Yeah. I got one other text message that night, and I looked at it and it says, hey, this is Cody Rhodes. Uh, I, I heard about the kick. Are you all right? And Cody had already been gone from the company for like several months at this point. So it didn't even strike me until months later that it might not have been Cody texting me because I didn't have his number. So it was just a text message out of the blue. I talked to him. I was like, yeah, no, I'm fine. That was a hard kick. He's like, yeah, I've seen Kofi catch a couple guys out over the years. Just want to make sure you were okay. And I was like, hey, not as okay as you, man. You're going to get to wrestle Shibata. And I was like, so we just chatted for a minute. I was like, that was that. It was very polite. And I saw Cody for the first time since then at the, uh, the Ring of Honor show in Fort Lauderdale. And I asked him about it. I was like, was that actually you? Because I, like, I was like, it didn't strike me until later that it might have been Larry checking on me again from just another phone that I wouldn't have. And he's like, no, that was me. Yeah, he's like, yeah, I've, I've become a connoisseur of people getting hit with that kick over the years, so I wanted to make sure you were okay. It's like, that's damn nice uh-huh. of you, Cody. Where did he get your number from? He just got it from someone? He just asked around until someone had, like, I, I think he just, because obviously he's still in contact with the guys there, mm-hmm. so he's like, hey, does anyone have Gotcha's number? He's like, yeah, pass it along. And speaking so of I, Ring, I, of, Ring I, of Honor, what is, what is your deal with Ring of Honor right now? Uh, well, I just started up with them. I'll, I'll be back at uh, TV this coming uh I believe uh, next week in Philadelphia. Well, it'll be next week right now. I don't know when this is going to post, so I don't know time-wise. It'll be the uh, the December taping right after uh, Final Battle. Okay. So, uh, and we go from there uh, next year, obviously. So, uh, there, there's been some good talk on both ends. I'm very excited for the opportunities there. It's nice to get to work with guys who are very passionate about wrestling. And, uh, you know, obviously, BJ Whitmer and Delirious have both been great to me. Uh, I've known uh, I've known BJ and, and uh, Delirious off and on for probably over a decade now. Um, it's also the fun thing of seeing guys I've known for so long, again, popping up. Uh, Silas Young, I wrestled in 2004 in California. Mm-hmm. Like, this is going way back. Um, guys like him, Jay Lethal, I worked with in uh, 2004 as well. Um, Beer City Bruiser, I knew when he was at Harley's. Frankie Kazarian, uh, probably. He's been Frankie, around. yeah. Frankie and Chris, I've known forever. Um so it's just really nice to get to sort of see all these guys and be working with people I like and that know me and that it's not just – it's not walking into that environment where no one trusts you because they're like, oh, is this guy a stooge? Is this guy going to you – know, what's he like? I don't, I don't, I don't trust it's a, I don't like that whole prison environment. I feel like that's kind of how WWE was. It was kind of like going into prison. There's a lot of guys have that constant shield up. And I'm like, dude, no one gets into wrestling to be miserable. Let's have some fun, you know? Mm-hmm. So you are you are you in talks with maybe signing a deal with them or that's something you just don't know uh, at the moment? Uh it's something we're talking about. It's just obviously towards the end of the year, they're they're more still just like, hey, we're gonna we'll use you right now, see how it goes. Uh, obviously, they're not gonna sign me before December because that would be silly, mm-hmm. you know. So we'll we'll see how things go in the new year. Um, yeah, been I'm, I'm very excited for it. Have you been in talks with Impact at all? I know they're looking for a lot of talent. Uh, I have not as of yet. Um, I keep meaning to contact Sanjay because I know he's the one with the who's uh, doing that now. Um, yeah, I just haven't gotten around to it, which is kind of weird because they're I'm I'm still living in Orlando, so they're right here. Mm-hmm. Um, they do have their tapings coming up first uh, July, sorry January tenth. Uh, oh yeah, and then they just moved their offices to Toronto and they hired Don Callis. And oh wow, Scott Demore is their executive. Uh, team now so they're running the show there right now as of like this week those guys are running the show in canada so i know they're doing the one tapings um in florida first week of january and then march is the next tapings which i believe the word is windsor that's where scott demore has his school so then they're starting to do a lot of canada stuff and i know they're they're out pursuing guys so i was just wondering if you had any contact no, I think a lot of the time, I think with me, a lot of people have had a real wait and see attitude. And a big part of that is because there was so much misinformation put out about me during my time in WWE that I feel like a lot of promoters are very, they're, they keep waiting to see when I'm going to cause a problem, quote unquote, or get into a fight or be difficult to work with, uh, which is simply, I'm not. <laughs> You can ask any any promoter I've worked for, any uh, any kid who's come to a seminar that I've run. Uh, I've actually, um, I, I highly recommend if you ever feel like 
talking to the guys over at uh, the London School of Lucha Libre. They're the original trainers of Will Ospreay. I've done a couple of seminars for them. Okay. And they've they put me over there. Like, we've had, you know, Rey Mysterio. We've had Low Key. We've had uh, all these guys in there. Uh, Cassandro, like, Ultimo Dragon. He's like, and they always say the same thing. You, have, you give the best, the best seminars we have. Because one of my big things is, like I said, no one should be miserable in wrestling. No mm-hmm. one should get into this and be sad or unhappy or angry. My whole thing is... Try to think. Try to use your brain. Don't don't think. You just have to do something because you were told that's the way it's done. Like I'm, I'm a big believer in question what you're asked to do. And if they don't have a reason, either figure a reason out or, uh, or you know, consider changing it. I, I, a good example of this, uh, just I, I saw the I guess the Young Bucks got into it with some fans online because the fans were calling them out about the length of time they were in the ring on a tag. Okay. And. The answer to this question is actually really simple, and a lot of people miss it. What is the rule when it comes to tags? How long do you have? I, I'm asking you genuinely. Like, how long do you have when a tag is made? Oh, like to get into the ring? Yeah, to to, to switch out guys. How long do you have? Yeah, less than ten seconds. No, the the actual answer is a five count. Okay. Well, yeah, now, I guess count, technically speaking, yes, yes, it is a yeah. five count. Yes. Yeah, so that, and that's the thing, is that the big mistake fans make is for some reason they always say five seconds. But Rather it's not than a five, five seconds. Yeah, it's a five count. However long it takes you to get to five. It's just like, you know, the old cliche with parents. Like, you have the count of three. One. And that five count can take 20 seconds. Yeah, it can take 20 seconds. I, I've told referees before, if, like, we've got a spot or something that's going to require a little more time, like, hey, you know, buy us some time in there. Give us the whole one. Mm-hmm. Come on, you got to get out of the ring. Two, come on, man! I'm telling you, you gotta get out of this ring. Don't make me get all the way there. Three, so to the point where they've taken them a minute to get to five. But that's the whole idea. So if you, it was actually five seconds or three seconds for the pinfall or anything like that, every single slow count would be negated, mm-hmm. legitimately because it was too long. Every referee who crawls to make the pin after they've been squashed in the corner and makes the slow three, every guest referee who fails to fucking count right away. All these things would actually be illegal and would negate the finish to every match. They don't because the ruling is, number one, five. it's a count. It's always a five count, a ten count on the outside if you're down, or a twenty count, or a twenty count if you're down, a ten count if you're standing. Uh, you have a three count to make a pinfall. Uh, or even the idea of uh, referee's discretion. Ultimately, the referee can dictate whether or not something is legal or legitimate or if it's illegal. Mm-hmm. So if the referee wants to, does not want to disqualify you, that's why it's something you see a lot in Japan where like a guy might get DQ'd for something in the first match, but you'll see a pile driver on the table in the last match and they don't get DQ'd. It's because, well, main event, they're not, they're not going to stop they're, these they're, guys. They're going to have a little bit more leniency on the main event, obviously. Yeah. So it's like that sort of thing is you can understand, but I feel like we're really bad as a, as wrestlers about educating the audience on this stuff. But I do think as students of wrestling, we should make it a point to learn it ourselves. To be like, okay, why do we do this? How can we do this? How can we do this better? What are we failing to do? What are we not doing? Why are we not connecting with the crowd when we do our matches? How can we connect with the crowd better? And I do feel like a lot of time people don't ask those questions. But that's what I stress when I teach is that look at why you're doing something and figure out why you're doing it. Have a reason. And uh, we're going to wrap it up here. But before we go... I need to hear a Dusty Rhodes impression because I know you do a pretty good one. Give us a story as Dusty before we wrap it up here. I, I will say this. I don't know that I do a good Dusty Rhodes you do, impression. You do a great I do, Dusty I do, Rhodes impression. I, I do an impression of someone doing an impression of Dusty it's, Rhodes. It's good. So I'm going to tell I'm going to tell a story, but I'm actually going to be doing an impression of Terry Taylor doing an impression of oh, Dusty okay. Rhodes. So years ago, um, there, was, there was a row on an airplane that would have uh, – the seats, uh, two rows of seats facing each other. So on this particular flight, this is when uh, Terry's in WCW, I believe, and Dusty has the book. Dusty had a brand new Walkman. He was very proud of it. It was when Walkmans first came out. So he's got the headphones in, volume turned all the way up. Um, the uh, cassette player sitting on his lap, and Dusty's taking notes. So Terry Taylor sitting across from him goes, American Dream, baby, too sweet to be thou, man of the hour. I'm funky like a monkey. And then Dusty like looks up, takes his headphones off, goes, hmm? And Terry's like, oh, nothing, nothing, dream. Nothing, dream. <laughs> okay. Puts the headphones back on. Make a dream, daddy. I'll make you live a quiver. I'm going to beat you from pillar to post. He does the whole thing. Again, say something, Terry? No, no, dream. No, no, go back to it. 
He said, I never lost a match before that flight, and I never won one after it. <laughs> He's like, 25 years later, I'm at Diamond Dallas Page's house, Christmas. Page always had a big Christmas party. Me and Dusty are sitting on the back porch, you know. We're having a cigar. It's quiet. Dusty doesn't even look at me, but he takes takes a drag off the cigar and just goes, the cassette was never on. <laughs> and immediately Terry knows what he's talking about, that the whole wow. thing was he had the he had the volume turned all the way up, but he wasn't playing. So Terry thinks he's listening to music, and the whole time he's just listening to Terry do the impression of him. And he's like, okay, you're going to make fun of me. All right, well, I guess you're not going over ever again. Wow, wow, wow. Well, that was a great story. And before we let you go here, uh, give me, like, you know, your next month. Where can we see you? Um, you know, obviously plug some of your stuff that's coming up. Tell us, you know, exactly where we can see Simon Grimm. Uh, well, you'll be able to see me, obviously, at Ring of Honor. Uh, uh, this is, I uh, believe, December 13th. Uh, next Next uh, Wednesday. Sun, uh, Saturday of next sa- Saturday of next week. I'm sorry. Saturday of next week. Seventeenth or thirteenth. Uh, Sixteenth. Sixteenth uh, is the Saturday. Yeah. I'm terrible with dates. That's something <laughs> I'm always very bad at. Uh, I'm at uh, wrestling has it tomorrow in Rhode Island on the January fourteenth. Uh, I'll also actually be appearing for uh, at wrestle uh, at the. Uh, I'm so bad at keeping up on this stuff. I have a calendar with it all written down. So it's like I'm going to top my head. Hang on. I'm actually going to. I'm actually going to pull up my calendar. Yeah, Hang no, on. No, for second. sure. Um. Because I'm so awful at remembering these things. This is this is why I actually have to write it all down. Because obviously my job's getting hit in the head. So remembering things like this <laughs> is pretty bad. Um, let's see here. So uh, yes, July 16th for Ring of Honor in Philadelphia. January and then, January 16th. You mean, right? Uh, no, ju- uh, July. Or I'm sorry, uh, December 16th. December, oh God. Okay, oh, let's go. Edit this for the love of God. I'm just <laughs> yeah. falling falling in a hole. It's 10:47 at night. I've been yeah. talking for two hours. I'm Terrible, but uh, okay. So January, or so December sixteenth, ROH Philadelphia. January fourteenth, wrestling as tomorrow in Rhode Island. Uh, February twenty uh, fourth, I'll actually be at AWE in uh, I believe that's Virginia, um, as well as uh, I'm actually going to be doing a signing in Queens on uh, March the tenth. I'll have more information on that when we're getting closer to it. Um, and so I will also be at uh, WrestleCon as well, doing a signing and a show. Uh, so I'll be there during WrestleMania weekend. Uh, those are just the ones I, I basically am, have written down right now because, as I said, I'm really bad about this stuff. I I get that. It's like I figure out where I'm going when I get my travel and my deposit. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> and uh, it's one of those things. Yeah. Plugs. You have the Pro Wrestling Tea Store. Anything else we should know about? I do have a Pro Wrestling Tea Store. Uh, you can search under Simon Grimm. Uh, also, you can find me on. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Devious Journey. Uh, I also am on Facebook at Devious Journey. As well as I'm still at GotStyle WWE on Instagram because Instagram won't let me change it, so I'm stuck with that one for a while. Um, yeah, that's uh, if you if you uh, are a fan of uh, cult movies, uh, there's a guy named Brandon Tenold who did a review of uh, of Life Force, the uh, Toby Hooper movie that I actually appear in the uh, review of the film. You can find that on YouTube. I also uh, recently uh, did a panel for Trauma Films with uh, Dr. Chuck Tingle. So if you're Track that down on on uh, YouTube as well. It's uh, some interesting stuff about the importance of independence in the creation of art. And uh, yeah, I'll probably just you know I'll come over, hang out at your house sometime randomly, just because you know, I can do that. I'll just break into your home. You can't question it. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, you know, we thank you for your time today, Simon, and just want to let everybody out there know that if you're looking for Simon Grimm merchandise, pro wrestling tees. Also, Heal by Nature merchandise is also available at Pro Wrestling Tees. Thanks a lot for your time tonight, Simon. Have a great day. Not a problem. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Four.